So hello, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Georges Benjamin. I'm the executive director at the American Public Health Association. And today's webinar represents a collaboration between several organizations that recognize the important relationships between healthy people and healthy democracy. Now, in um, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine in June of 2021 had a workshop workshop sponsored by their roundtable on population health improvement that brought together several of the presenters that we have here today to share the research and tools to advance understanding. And as information about civic engagement and civic infrastructure to advance health equity is available at the link provided. And you're gonna see that link several times uh, in the chat box for folks to, um, to be able to link on and hopefully even play with as we, as we go through this presentation. Now today, the 31st of August, is a perfect time to continue that discussion that started at the, at the academies. Um, as today is the last day of the annual Civic Health Month, a nonpartisan month-long celebration, which occurs during the month of August, that uplifts the link between health and voting. Now our webinar will continue to highlight relevant frameworks and tools for action, uh, especially an exciting new tool called the Health and Democracy Index. And, and I got to see this thing. This is absolutely an, an amazing, fun tool to play with. And speakers will present information as nonpartisan, keyword nonpartisan, subject matter experts. The webinar will demonstrate evidence informed relationships between voting, civic engagement, and our health. Now, its purpose is to one, introduce the Health and Democracy Index, and two, put voting and civic engagement in the context of advancing health equity and in the framework of the political determinants of health. So we have some really neat speakers here today. They were on the flyer, but let me just um, kind of introduce them in bulk and then each of them will speak um, um, in order. Um, and we have Daniel Dawes. Mr. Dawes is um, the director, I'm sorry, Daniel Dawes, who is the uh, executive director of the Satra Health Leadership Institute at the Morehouse School of Medicine. We have Jeannie Ayers, who's the Executive Director of the Healthy Democracy, Healthy People. Aliyah Bathia, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Vote ER and Civic Health Month. And Don Hunter, who's the Director in Southwest Region of the Network for Public Health Law. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to um, Mr. Dawes, Daniel. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin, for that very kind introduction. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. Good morning to our friends on the West Coast. It's a real honor for me to join you this, this afternoon and um, discuss a very important topic during this uh, Civic Engagement Month. Basically suffrage, or what's more commonly understood as the right to vote. It's a constitutional right, an intangible that is representative of its constituents one that wields tremendous power and influence should we choose or be allowed to engage in it. Because the bottom line is that voting can make the difference or mean the difference between life and death, health or sickness for many people in our communities. A nod goes out to those of you who marched on Saturday and on the anniversary of the March on Washington, all in the name of protecting our voting rights, an important component of the political determinants of health, which in effect enables us to identify who benefits from the current distribution of health or disease, or who has the power to change the allocation of resources and power that shape patterns of health agency. I hope that by the end of this presentation, it will become apparent how voting goes beyond our association to party lines, as Dr. Benjamin just mentioned, as well as politics and how the crucial act of voting immeasurably affects our lives, including our personal health and the overall health of our country. In the words of George Santayana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so I wanna take a few moments uh, to truly understand why America is facing the challenges of today. We have to revisit, of course, our yesterday. 
So let's look at what happens when you deny a group of people the right to vote. And I'm going to start in 1641 because Massachusetts uh, becomes the first colony to legalize slavery then under the passage of the Body of Liberties Law, which later became part of the Articles of the New England Confederation. You see Connecticut, New York, and others uh, following suit. And under Section 91, it states, quote, there shall never be any bond slavery, villainage, or captivity amongst, um, amongst us unless it be lawful captives taken in just wars and such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us. This exempts none from servitude who shall be adjudged thereto by authority, unquote. The fate of these captives was sealed when the bodies of liberty statues were amended to include a slave woman's offspring to be a legal slave, meaning that the offspring would have the same legal status in society as their mother, a slave. And as if those policies weren't enough to keep a group of black and indigenous people down, policymakers worked, they developed, negotiated, passed, implemented, and enforced additional policies designed to restrict these marginalized groups from addressing their social determinants of health needs. They were explicitly prohibited by law from raising their own food, earning their own money, learning to read or write, or even the ability to move, right, and exercise beyond a certain mile radius, or having to have permission slips, or even lanterns when they were moving about. You see, throughout the history of the United States, and like so many in power, social and economic policy decisions were made by a few men. In this case, slave owners who worked overtime to restrict certain population groups from realizing their full health potential. And it wasn't until more than 200 years after the Bodies of Liberties laws were enacted that African-American men gained the right to vote when the 15th Amendment was ratified. And then nearly 100 years after that, the Voting Rights Act was passed. And it is with the help of the newly enfranchised Southern Blacks in reconstructed states that Ulysses S. Grant, for instance, was able to win the popular vote by 300,000 in that historical presidential election of 1868. Why was that critical? Because that crucial election led to fighting back attempts to undermine health equity at the time. American history, as we know, is replete with similarly tragic stories in other vulnerable and minoritized groups, indigenous and Native American populations, uh, those who identify as Latinos or Latinx, Asian Americans, Muslim, gender and sexual minorities, and the list goes on, all of which have been targeted at one point or another by unjust policies that were passed owing to voting or voter suppression tactics. So if my recount of black suffrage did not make it obvious to you that a clear line exists between the structural conditions that we are born into, we are raised in and we die in, and the political determinants of health, which are the drivers of these scenarios. Well, let's think about it this way. The political determinants of health create the social drivers, including the poor environmental conditions, the inadequate transportation we see today, the unsafe neighborhoods, the insecure housing, the lack of healthy food options that affect all dynamics of health. And they involve the systematic process of structuring relationships, of distributing resources and administering power, operating simultaneously in ways that mutually reinforce or influence one another to shape opportunities that either lead to health equity or for the most part, usually exacerbate these health inequities that we see downstream. These political determinants of health inequitably distribute social, medical, and other social determinants. And, and they create the structural barriers to equity for population groups that lack power and privilege. Yet for different reasons, we tend to shy away from the role that political forces have played in creating, maintaining, and increasing the inequities that we observe today and the impact that they have on all forces that affect our health. 
We've also failed to recognize how past political determinants have been leveraged to advance policies to bolster or hinder health equity. You know, I wanted to quote uh, Joseph Kennedy, uh, former ambassador and the father of John F. Kennedy, President uh, Kennedy, where he stated at one point that there are no accidents in politics. Understanding then that political outcomes are not accidental, we can understand that our political system engages in a predictable pattern relative to the advancement of health equity. And if that is true, then it's absolutely important that health equity proponents understand the history, the politics, the policies, and the tools that have been used to advance their agenda. One idea is ballot augmentation, for instance. Well, to really drive home this message, I want you to consider what is happening around us today. Amidst this COVID-19 pandemic or this quadruple pandemic that we find ourselves in, just let these numbers wash over you for a moment. After now battling with this pandemic for more than one and a half years, the latest release of the CDC's life expectancy data shows us that as of July 2021, the decline is even greater. Michael Marmot says that life expectancy as a measure of health tells us a great deal about how we're doing as a society, but the inequalities in that society tell us even more. So overall, we've lost 1.5 years, but when you disaggregate this, you see that Black Americans have lost 2.9 years, and those who identify as Latino or Latinx have lost three years. And the statistics aren't much better in the vaccine space either. As we continue to learn and roll out a national emergency management response to this pandemic, we have yet to achieve an equitable one. Minoritized populations continue to have an uneven playing field. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation's latest data on COVID-19 vaccinations by race and ethnicity uh, that was published in July, they stated that Black and Hispanic people have had consistently lower rates of vaccination compared to their white counterparts across most states. And while these statistics are disturbing, we know that these results are the consequences of action or inaction from generations ago. Through political agendas and policies, these vulnerable populations are left to deal with these unsurmountable structural barriers today, bearing the brunt of the pandemic. Well, if we are to affect any change in advancing health equity and rebuilding an intentional and inclusive civic infrastructure whatsoever, we must make our voices prominent and demand for change. We must enlist the help of our government at the local, state, regional, federal, and even international level to overcome these inequities that reach beyond the healthcare context to a society as a whole. We can tackle the broad and collateral effects of the political determinants of health by targeting three major aspects that interact in various ways to advance or hinder our health outcomes. Voting, government, policy, Attached to these are four factors that all impact our political state and policy development. Engagement, money, demographics, technology. So let me just quickly begin with voting, a fundamental civic duty in our, in our nation. It's arguably the most important aspect of the political determinants of health because one, it affords us an opportunity to directly engage in and work on immediate policy solutions as well as long-term policy solutions to the issues that are affecting our communities. And secondly, it installs the policymakers who will form the decisions and drive our agenda at a macro level. Voting provides us an opportunity to address the long-term biological and societal consequences of the determinants of health and enables the decisions, research, programs, and policies that allow us to tackle these issues. Yet many people fail to recognize or take for granted voting's impact on their health, their well being, and their life expectancy. And as such, it is clear that in order to ensure change, we must engage as much of the voter population as possible. Because a lack of civic engagement equates to a lack of voice, which means no resolution of these issues. A lack of civic engagement results in perpetuating the same results. 
i.e. the continuation of the inequities that already exist. Americans must understand that by remaining apathetic, they are contributing to the long-term survival of these inequities, which are the very thing contributing to the deterioration of their health and beyond, and ultimately the health of this country, as well as that of others. So how do we turn America around? Well, although you've heard me you know, mention, or you've heard of a grim reality uh, in much of my presentation so far, I want to send a clear message that there is still hope for America. According to the World Health Organization, these health inequities in most cases are systematic and avoidable, avoidable. And there is much that we can do to turn this daunting scenario around. You've already heard me talk about the importance of civic engagement and voting, but at the heart of the health equity movement are health equity proponents, advocates like you, who must directly act to address the ramifications of the political determinants of health. These individuals are the ones who help connect the dots for stakeholders. They help show how voting, government, and policy impact our ability to lead health or healthy and quality lives, and how these political determinants of health interventions have prevented us from achieving health equity for individuals living in the United States. Well, how do we also turn America around further? Well, as we're moving for forward, I wanna briefly discuss two factors that affects our current political affairs and policy development that we should also be thinking about. Demographic changes and the growing physical disconnect between those represented and those who represent them, as well as technology. Well, one US representative today currently represents 750,000 constituents, and that is expected to climb in the years to come. The disconnect grows even larger as the population of America is expected to grow to over 400 million by 2058. Compounding this is the changing demographics of America. Collectively, racial and ethnic minorities will be the leading population group in the US by 2050, according to the Pew Research Center. Yet our government is still not representative of the diversity that exists in America today. And our policies have yet to equally benefit all groups in this country. Well, moving on about technology, we know that technology permeates and exacerbates these issues that we've been talking about. Um, technology has helped to engage and influence so many of us and in different aspects of our lives, from big data and data analytics to social media. Technology either has helped us to share more information or to spread misinformation. Technology will continue to be a force, a major force in elections, helping to limit or advance civic, enga civic engagement and education. At the Satcher of Leadership Institute, our goal is to aid in data equity, as well as addressing the, do the no data, no problem uh, dilemma, which we're facing, which is why we launched our health equity tracker a few weeks ago. We partnered with the CDC Foundation, with Gilead Sciences, Google.org, AARP, and others to understand what health equity data are already being collected and to identify the data gaps that currently exist. The end result is a tracker that maps data on the trajectory of COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths across the country, including the US territories, broken down by race, ethnicity, gender, as well as other var variables, comorbidities, that strike disproportionately in these vulnerable communities. The social and political determinants of health down to the county level where available. So in closing, I wanna again thank the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine and VODER for having invited me here today to discuss this critical topic. I also wanna challenge everyone to rise to the occasion in creating a more healthy, equitable and inclusive America. It is only by all of us creating synergies, sharing our knowledge, such as what we're doing with the Health Equity Tracker and the Health and Democracy Index, uh, which you'll soon hear about, and outright naming the injustices that we face, that we will ever stand a fighting chance. We must demand that everyone has a fair chance to be heard, and we can do so by doing our part 
by casting our votes. I'll leave you all with these simple yet powerful words from my dear friend and mentor, the founder of our institute, Dr. David Satcher, where he says the challenge is to become part of the struggle, to make a positive difference. Thank you all so much again for the privilege of your time and your continued leadership in advocating, in protecting and expanding opportunities to vote, as well as in advancing health equity for all groups. Daniel, let me thank you very much for that very powerful presentation. And now- Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd like to now bring um, Ms. Jenny Ayers. Um, Jenny. Now, Paul, I think it's, it's Jean Ayers. Yep, Jean Ayers. Jean? Unless you're in my uh, immediate family, then they always call me Jeannie. <laughs> Uh, thank you, and I want to uh, thank thank um, Dr. Daz for the the uh, situating and putting this work into a broader context of where we're where we are uh, starting from today. I am going to share my screen and. So Healthy Democracy, Healthy People is a nonpartisan coalition of um, more than 10 organizations that initially came together in 2020 as Vote Safe Public Health to assure that people had the opportunity to vote during the pandemic. And, and we wanted to be sure that we weren't just saying, you know, wear your mask and be careful. And uh, we wanted to be asserting and clear that voting itself is a health action. Uh, post-election, we began to say, what, what do we do next to continue to build our capacity? And um, so I, I want today to just quickly go through uh, a few things. One is I want to introduce a few practices that are designed to build our capacity um, or our power to advance health equity by influencing the social and political conditions that have just been mentioned and described and those include organizing narrative data and knowledge, organizing policy processes and resources, and organizing strengthening um, community capacity. So the process of building the, the, uh, the coalition and coming together for this work and for all of you participating today is actually um, a display of that organizing and strengthening community capacity. And then we'll name a few actions that people can take right now to promote civic, uh, uh, full civic and voter participation. Hmm. Oops. Um, the first place to start, and I think it's so clear when you listen to um, Dr. Dawes, that health is a complex system or set of systems that are intersecting and influencing one another. And to advance health equity, we have to develop the power to influence those systems. So a systems approach is very helpful. I mean, it's, it's something, it's not a discrete program, um, but here's a simple description of a systems approach. We say, what's the problem? What's the pattern? Um, so what is holding that pattern in place? Now, what can we do about it? So you identify the existing pattern and this pattern that, that um, uh, Daniel just described is a long-standing pattern of inequities and political inequities. We say what's holding it in place, some of the decisions and policies, um, the political determinants are holding those patterns of health inequities in place. And then you say, well, what can we do? What next? Um, and there is hope here, I find it very hopeful, that you can actually change the pattern in a, in a system with three to seven simple practices. So you just have to keep engaging and participating and continuing to uh, ask, how is that working? Is the pattern getting moving more to the direction that we want? Um, and what can we do to change it? So here's something that I find really kind of illustrative um, of the, the pattern of our work in public health. I selected a bunch of public health agency mission statements and the ones on the left, they all look great to me, 
you know, saving lives and protecting people, protecting and improving light, the health of all, preserving and promoting health. Um, <clears throat> all of these on the left, I could go to work every day and feel good about my work. But the um, predecessor to NASM, the Institute of Medicine, had, had um, brought forth the definition of public health or the aim of public health as what we do collectively to assure the conditions in which all people can be healthy. And I underline that assure the conditions because that's very different than the things that we've done with our organizations and our mission statements. One is saying, we're gonna go and do some good. And the other is saying, we're gonna figure out how to do what's necessary to assure that everyone can be healthy. And that's the invitation today and how we reconcile these two frames of reference change or shape the possibilities of what we can accomplish. So this was very helpful for me. Our health's almost completely connected to living conditions, but those living conditions are completely connected to our capacity to act. So in order to effect change in the system, we have to be intentional about building our collective capacity to act or our power, our ability to influence the political determinants. The community organizers name these three practices which help to um, build power and can, can change the power in a system. One is organizing people and strengthening the capacity of communities. Um, and I've just described how we're doing that with the Healthy Democracy, Healthy People uh, Coalition. We're aligning efforts and strengthening relationships across organizations and sectors to promote access to the ballot for everyone. Then organizing narrative and knowledge and data, collectively promoting the understanding of the relationship um, between health and civic engagement, inclusion and social cohesion. That's the organizing the narrative, the tool that we're sharing today, the Health and Democracy Index was the coalition coming forth in December and January saying, one thing we can do is organize the narrative around voting. We can help, we can help expand the understanding of, those, of these relationships and add credibility to this understanding of why it's important that we have inclusive voting policies. And then the third, organizing resources and policies and how the systems and places work. In, not, all these things are, are interconnected and it's important that you, we don't just talk about something, but we then are working together to change the policies to support the narrative and do it with a broader set of people. So we'll also be talking about policies that have high yield potential right now. So in our regular like public health and my public health experience, we have lots of tools. Um, we have research, data collection, analysis, health assessment, um, planning uh, reports. We have bully pulpit. We have op-eds, policy at all levels, not just at a state or a federal legislative level. We have it in terms of our professional organizations and our, our work organizations, our service delivery. Um, all of these things are, are tools in our regular uh, practice. When we've been talking about civic infrastructure, we have the ability to create and convene groups to strengthen relationships with group with those who have been um, not at the table in decision making spaces as often and and um, prioritizing equity in those spaces and aligning our actions with what we know creates health. And then this continual process of asking questions. Is this working? Um, what are our assumptions? What should we be doing? Um, the Health and Democracy Index is um, uh, the focus of today. And it was in January, February, we said, we really could do more to make what we know um, more clear and give tools to a broader set of people, all of you and, and partners in, in voting advocacy and, and um, uh, policy makers on why it's important to be voting. What, what's the benefit for making it easy for, for uh, everyone who's eligible to vote? Because narrative is so important, it determines how issues are understood and framed. Um, going 
just in the last seven months, somehow the narrative, a dominant narrative has emerged around election integrity that has then created the, uh, a shrinking of access um, and, and support for public policy that makes it harder to vote. Uh, and there is not, we have not in our field come forth and effectively made the case why a expanded engagement in, the, in, in um, uh, voting will help us as a whole. So what's our role? What's our issues that we report on? These are the kinds of questions that we should be asking and what assumptions and the values are amplified when we do or don't participate in a conversation. And we can't just say things, we also have to align it with our work in our words and actions. So here are some of the actions civic health champions can be taking, um, embracing this imperative to address structural uh, inequities and promote policies that ensure and encourage civic and voter participation. And that's at all sorts of levels. Again, um, promote the understanding of these critical connections and that's the tool that we're sharing today is one, one way to do that. Building and leveraging your influence to impact policies in your national and local organizations, in your professional and your personal roles. Encouraging voter registration and all the services that you provide. Um, you know, we, we are often the service delivery for, for things like WIC and SNAP and um, healthcare uh, and uh, Medicaid. So there's lots of different levers in our interface with the public where we can be promoting voter registration. And um, conducting research and data analysis. Uh, we had seen that the um, advisory group for the 2030 Healthy People 2030 had included voting metrics, which would be very, very helpful. And it didn't get included in the final, but we would like to see it reinstated in, the, um, in, as, in an amendment to Healthy People 2030 so that we can see what's our progress. On, in, on engaging a broader set of people. Um, so promoting policies that expand access to the ballot, there's a number of policies. This would be a high yield area. Uh, the no excuse mail and early voting, um, automatic voter registration opportunities. And when you think about health equity uh, and who does and doesn't have access, we are currently ha have a system that does promote uh, voter registration through driver vehicle registration. That's a different population often than the population that um, may receive Medicaid services. So there's a, a, an inequity in access uh, right there. And when we're trying to close gaps, that could be a very powerful uh, uh, space to be working in. And assuring easy and equitable access to voter registration is an urgent priority. And I'll just quickly say, in, first of all, I wanna say that the 2020 election was an amazing success. It was an amazing success. We had the highest turnout for, for years, 66.8%, 161 million people voted, more than 100 million voted early by mail or in person. And yet there were still 80 million eligible non-voters. And the top reason that they name for not voting is not being registered. So there's space, like there's something we could do right now. On September 15th, we're holding a, a, a follow-up webinar that will look more deeply at what are, the, what are some of the policy levers that we could be using to expand automatic voter registration through programs. Um, I love this, this vision. Every generation leaves behind a legacy. And I hope um, more inclusion will be ours. Thank you. Jean, thank you very, very much. And so now I'd like to have um, um, Don Hunter um, speak. Don? make sure I'm unmuted. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. And uh, I'm really excited that I get to spend most of my time talking to you about the index itself. And I want to thank Jean and Daniel for giving us such great background and context. 
Um, and really, I want to, I know Jean mentioned this, but after the election, we were part of the Vote Safe Public Health Coalition. We really, we had a conversation about how do we keep the movement going? And in one of those conversations, Jean said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a scorecard of some sort? Like, how do we, how do we know how the states are doing on health equity and voting? And I said, let me think about that. And that conversation um, led to what you're going to see today. And so I want to acknowledge uh, and thank Jean for being a partner in, in, the, in this development. And also, I want to recognize Jerome Amurao, who is a master's student at Gilling School of Global Public Health at UNC, and um, for his assistance uh, with research on this project. I believe he's on the line, so hi. And, um, and I just want to note that there will be time for questions at the end. So um, in just a few moments, I am going to pop a link in the chat so we can go through the index together. But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. I'm going to tell you how the index was developed and talk about our goals for the project. And then we're going to walk through the website and then end on some next steps. So you may have a question about why is a public health lawyer working on the Health and Democracy Index? Well, the very first item that I got to publish with the Network's Law and Policy Insights series was this article. Uh, more than a vote, civic engagement in health amid COVID-19, as an opportunity to highlight issues with safe voting, but also the importance of voting for public health and the development of more inclusive and representative policies. I've also since then written on the impact of felon reenfranchisement on health. Uh, I've done a couple of webinars focused on voting and health with partners like the Voting Rights Lab and Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. And I also wrote about lessons from the 2020 election for the second volume of the COVID policy playbook. And personally, this is just something I'm very passionate about. I do volunteer work for election protection, and I also volunteer with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. So as part of the research into that article I just shared with you, um, I found this here, which is a list of health metrics that are associated with civic engagement or voting. And so I started to just kind of pull this list together. And one of the most common, commonly studied probably and referenced is self-rated health. And self-rated health is simply how you rate your own health, either relative to another point in time, relative to other people your age or something along those lines. Um, but these other things that are on the list are also associated with uh, civic engagement and specifically with voting. Um, so that's chronic, uh, chronic disease prevalence, disability status, use of healthcare services, health risk behaviors like smoking. So these are all things that we know from the literature are connected to civic engagement or voting. And this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the more common ones that you'll find. So um, I found the, co the cost of voting index and as part of doing this research, and I'll tell you more about that index in a moment. And so I started to look at the data for some of these different indicators to see, you know, what, what is the connection, if any, with the data that we have? And so I saw this. And if you're a data person, I, I, mean, I hope you look at this and you get excited. Um, because I did. So if you take the average of the top 15 states and the average of the bottom 15 states and you if sorted by this cost of voting index, what you see is that on average, the top 15 states have better outcomes than the US average and the bottom 15 states have worse outcomes um, than the US average across the board. And so we started thinking about, well, how do we present this in a way that's more visually appealing than my simple table here and also helps to communicate the narrative around voting and health in a way that's useful for public health professionals, voting rights advocates, and just people out there trying to um, improve health equity. And so how do we tell the story behind this? So this is just a process, the process that we went through. So we started this project at the end of March in, um, of this year. Um, we, had, we did research and we've been doing research all along. Um, we had a stakeholder meeting uh, in April and then we use the results of that meeting to kind of hone our research a little bit more. We started working um, with uh, the Center for Civic Design. Thank you very much, Asher, for your work on conducting end user focus groups and, and um, end user testing. And we also had a second stakeholder meeting to, to discuss some of the refinements we made. Then over the course of the month of June, we finalized design and content. Um, and we had a, a last stakeholder meeting in July of 20 of 2021, 21, so just recently, um, and did some more user testing. And then now we're here for the launch today. So that, that's really exciting. And I will make a note that the planning group is um, amazing. And it's a group of six of us that we've been meeting weekly pretty much um, since the beginning of this project to make sure that we get it off the ground and we go through questions about data about narrative, about feedback that we're receiving. It's really been a great and collaborative process. And honestly, it's been one of the best 
team experiences have had and working on a project together to create something that is really just amazing. And so before we get into this last thing, before we get into the index itself, um, that as a result of the stakeholder groups that we held, we, um, we settled on these goals. And so the focus is really on a few key things. One, can we illustrate the connection between voting and health? Two, we want to expand the narrative, as you, as you heard Jean talk about, about voting to include the impact on our collective health. We want to support public health professionals in their roles to advance health equity and to improve population health. We want to strengthen connections among advocates and identify practical points of intervention, which you heard Jean talk about some of those, and we're going to hear some more at the end today. And we want to support the effort to strengthen access to the ballot. So hopefully as we walk through the index, we are going to show you how we met those goals. And so now I, I don't know, did you put it in the chat yet? Nope, here we go. So as we go through this, um, there is the link to the Health and Democracy Index. Please feel free if you are in a computer setting or on your phone, because you can look at this on your phone as well. Um, it is mobile friendly. Um, we'll walk through it and I'm going to have still shots and I'm going to explain some of the background of how we got to where we are, but you're welcome to walk through with me as I explain the word, the index. So this is our landing page. So the link, um, as I mentioned, I am going to explain some of the, of the images that you're going to see. And I just want to point out that on the right in this red circle here, that is um, a site navigation menu. So you can click on those to move around the site. But we hope that you'll actually take the time to scroll through because we were very um, deliberate in, or in the team in organizing this in a way that builds, on, builds the narrative and shows you the data behind each piece of narrative. So this is your landing page. And there are two core components. So as you land, as you start to scroll down, you're going to see this default graph. And that's the cost of voting index versus overall health. And the overall health is from America's health rankings. And there are 11 other metrics in addition to overall health that are included in the index. And you can, I hope, see that here a very clear correlation between better voting access and overall health in the top right quadrants of this graph. So overall health. Um, as I mentioned, this is from America's health rankings. It's a composite score that's calculated from all of the ranked measures for each state in America's health rankings. And um, this image is from 2019 and it includes state rankings. And I'll just note that if you use America's health rankings at all, you'll notice um, that for 2020, they did not give overall rankings, although they did share the scores. So we are using the overall health scores. And as I mentioned, that's because the literature is very clear that there is a connection between health and, um, and voting. So what's the cost of voting index? So this was an index that was developed by political science researchers at Northern Illinois University and was first published in 2016 as an analysis of the relative cost of voting in presidential election cycles from 1996 to 2016. Um, and then it was updated in 2020. And the cost of voting refers to the time and effort associated with casting a vote. And it's intended to characterize the overall electoral climate in each state or in other words, the extent to which each state embraces inclusivity in the electoral process versus restriction or exclusion. So as I mentioned, it was updated in 2020 to reflect recent state changes in automatic voter registration, early and absentee voting, and changes to voting locations, among other things, over previous elections. And really grateful to get to work with the author, um, lead author on this particular one, Scott Schroffnagel. Um, on understanding the index and talking about how to do a deeper data analysis. So there are two key components really of the cost of voting. Well, there are nine really total, but they can be categorized in these two ways. So these are things that impact your ability to register to vote and then your ability to cast a ballot. So that's registration deadlines, voter re um, registration restrictions. So limitations, for example, on third parties being allowed to register others to vote. Um, that's drive restrictions, pre-registration law. So can you register before you turn 18? Uh, automatic voter registration, and then casting a ballot, inconvenience. So, you know, wait times at the polls, um, voter ID laws and poll hours and early voting options. So here are some of the reasons why. We know um, that these are all things that affect electoral part participation. Um, the biggest barrier to voting really continues to be registration, right? And then there are other barriers related to casting your ballot, like having limited options, not having um, no excuse absentee, for example. 
And so just as a kind of snapshot of where the states are at, there's automatic voter registration in 20 states with two more starting in 2022. Um, there's online registration in most states, 40 states, but they're not all the same quality. Um, and there's same day registration in 20 states plus DC and 18 states that have election day registration. And most states have some fo form of early voting, but there's an asterisk there because there is significant variation. So early voting could be like the weekend before the election. Um, it could be 20 days out. Um, and then ID and less restrictive and um, less restrictive voter ID laws. And that means that there's no additional requirement placed on the voter to verify who they are for their ballot to be counted. So for example, um, I live in a state that does this, the local elections board can signature match to verify your ballot. So overall findings, more voting access, better health outcomes. I hope when you look at this, you see the very clear correlation. Um, and that's the upper right quadrant, as I mentioned on the previous, one of the previous slides. And the flip side of that is also true, right? The le less voting access is associated with worse health outcomes. So as you scroll through the site, you'll get to see this. You're gonna notice narrative boxes throughout and we encourage you to take the time to read them. Um, because they really do contain really key information, some of what you heard Daniel talk about, some of what you heard Jean talk about. You are also able to hide these boxes. I think there's a box in the upper left corner that allows you to collapse the box so that you can see the plots. And the takeaway message here when you arrive at voting policy and public health is that voting is important for stronger public health outcomes and that voting and health create a reinforcing feedback loop. So people who are healthy are more likely to vote and that shapes policy that reflects the needs of those voters. And that policy supports the health and well being of those voters, leading to continued likelihood of engagement throughout their lifespan. Um, and that's really important. So we, we want to break the negative cycle, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and get people into this positive feedback loop of being engaged and having better health and continuing to be engaged throughout their lifetimes. So as you scroll down, the next thing you're going to get to is this interactive voting policy picker. This is the second favorite part of my website. I'm saving them my favorite part for the end. But um, you'll see four things here. You're going to see inclusive registration, which is automatic same day and or election day states. Uh, vote at home. So these are states that have all mail elections or no excuse absentee voting. You're going to see restrictive voter ID. So this is going to be the states that require additional documentation at the polls, even after you've established your eligibility to vote. And then the last one you're going to see is voting rights restoration. So your rights, these are states where your rights are not lost or they are restored post incarceration if you have a felony conviction. There are explanations of these under each box, so you don't have to go looking around for what each means. And this particular image on the screen is for voting rights restoration. And you can hopefully see very clearly that states that do not permanently disenfranchise voters after a felony conviction have better health outcomes. And also side note, it's good for the health of those individuals to have their rights restored as well. So then as you scroll down, you're going to you're going to land on lower voter participation drives health disparities. And I showed you the reinforcing feedback loop already. And this is a reminder here that it works both ways, that voting disparities lead to health disparities, which lead to continued voting disparities. Policy is shaped by the people who turn up. And there's research to show that elected officials are more responsive to constituents who vote than those who don't. So on the site, you are going to get an explanation of how, just how voting is connected to health disparities. And if you move on in the site, you're going to see an example related to infant mortality. And again, you can collapse this box so you can see the graph. And um, there's a very clear correlation here, again, with states that have better voting access on the right and lower infant mortality rates. And um, you can see that this disparity, we can see, you don't see this on this particular graph, that this disparity shrinks across all racial and ethnic groups and states that have better civic participation. And data, those data are not included here yet, um, but we are working on how best to incorporate data on race, race and ethnicity and other populations. Um, but I have looked at this myself and, and seen that. And I think it's important to note that in general, this is also correlated with just better health outcomes. So um, infant mortality is a very important indicator of the health of a population. It tells us about access to care and it tells us about quality of care. So as you scroll through, you're gonna get two examples. So the first is, 
sorry, I've got my camera blocking me. Um, you're gonna see Colorado as an example of a state that is doing some things well. So Colorado voters are automatically registered through the Department of Motor Vehicles. They have same day and election day uh, registration options. They allow non-photo ID and rights are restored post-incarceration in the state of Colorado. And then if you keep going, if I can get my slides to advance, there you go. You're gonna see the flip side of that, which is uh, an example from Tennessee. So in Tennessee, there is not automatic same day or election day registration. Tennessee also has a very strict photo ID requirement. And if you don't have an approved photo ID, you have to vote a provisional ballot and then take extra steps to ensure that your ballot is counted. And then you also must petition for restoration of voting rights post sentence. So these are just two examples, but the fun part is that you're going to get to go through and look at your own states. But first you're gonna to get to this slide called closing the gap. Um, and so closing the gap covers some policy actions. So this is a lot of what you heard Jean talking about specifically, automatic voter registration and registration through other government services besides motor vehicle agencies where you already have to verify your identity. So you go through a pretty rigorous process. Um, and then the third one that uh, Jean mentioned, restoration of civic participation to the Healthy People 2030 um, goals. And if you go to the Healthy People 2020 page for civic participation, it's got a great summary and links to some very important uh, research on the topic. So it'd be great to have that restored to Healthy People 2030. And so if you actually click on the hyperlink in that text box, it'll take you to this page, Policy Implications, which is where you will see an explanation of the things that I was just describing. So then you get to start exploring a little bit more. You can look at how the plot changes for all of the health metrics we've included, and that's this drop down box here. Um, and you can select one of the 12 metrics that we have plotted against the cost of voting. So those are listed here in the drop down. And again, these are based on the literature reviews that we did. So self rated health, as I mentioned, which is one of the most common um, that you are going to find in the literature voter turnout, poor mental health days. So this is the number of um, poor mental health days reported in the previous 30 days, percent of adults receiving disability benefits, percent uninsured, active physicians per capita, infant mortality, which we've just seen, premature mortality, another important measure of population health, community and family safety, that's from America's health rankings as well, poverty, the Gini index, which is a measure of income inequality, and overall health, which I mentioned to you is the default um, is the default plot at the top of this website. And so these are really about individual health, about population health, and about other social determinants. So as one example of this, if you select poverty, this is what you're going to see. And again, you can actually hide this text box so you can see the graph and you can see, uh, again, another strong correlation between states that have better voting access and lower um, percentage of people living under the federal poverty level. And so, um, do you want to, if you want to know what all of these means, it's important that um, you know where to go find the definition. So on the methods page, you can see how all of these are defined. And so this is just a screenshot, but if you go to this page, you'll see all of the health and other population related metrics defined and why they are important um, for telling us about the health of individuals and communities. So then this is the part I think a lot of people um, will like and have liked so far through testing, and that's the state picker. And so you can go and look at specific states. And there are just a couple of notes here. So first is that this currently includes the 50 states. It does not include territories or freely associated states, and it does not include county level data. Um, those are things that have been suggested, but they're not in this particular iteration. And part of that is that we have we don't have the same data even for the territories, um, even though the territories participate in the um, behavioral risk factor surveillance system, for example, um, their data for those uh, territories is not available from other data sources on the same indicators. So that's something that we're working on looking at to include. So you get two views as you scroll down and you, um, you land on this pick a state, you can pick a state here we've picked Massachusetts and you're going to see the same things. For each state, you're going to see their voter turnout percentage, you're going to see their cost of voting index ranking, and you're going to see their premature mortality ranking. So Massachusetts is number four, great on premature mortality, also very high on the cost of voting index, and they have a pretty strong voter turnout. Um, and again, premature mortality is an important population health indicator, among other things that helps us answer the question, like, can you keep people in your society alive? 
right? That's a, it's a pretty good indicator if you're not able to do that. Um, so then you go through the second view of your state landing page. So if you click on Massachusetts, you're going to come through to the state page. And each state page includes primary metrics, um, which is the cost of voting index and overall health. It includes all four voting policies that I mentioned. It includes civic participation, both turnout and registration uh, percentages. And it includes all of the health metrics that we just went through. So you're going to be able to scroll through and see those. And so the next slide is really just an example. Um, health, community, if, and, and you get the idea as you go through, you'll see this as you scroll along on each state page. Importantly, you'll also see this. So you're going to see the health measure in purple. You're going to see a scale from high to low, so you know where that state falls relative to the other states. And you're going to see the definition and these definitions are consistent throughout the site so no matter where you are this is this is what you're going to see so if you're on the methods page you're going to see the same thing but it, we thought it was important to have this available as you're going through the website um, to be able to know what the definition is of the indicator that you're looking at so this is just one for self-rated health good or better for the state of massachusetts So these last two slides are kind of focused on part of why we're here today and one of those is what we can do so what there are things that we can do like registering to vote and showing up for elections right um, we just had a mayoral election uh, primary election here in st petersburg florida um, and you heard daniel uh, mention the march on for voting rights that happened this weekend i was at one of the events myself this past weekend it was the 58th anniversary and uh, and i just want to share there was a speaker there who was so inspiring she's an immigrant who is not able to vote here in the US, but she registers voters and canvasses neighborhoods. And really, I would just share that because it's so much a part of what civic engagement is about. And she was out there um, organizing people to do this march and she herself does not have the right to vote. And so um, I thought it was really inspiring. And I hope that the stories like that help us remember that in addition to voting, it's also about how we um, connect with other people in our community and how we inspire people to take action to improve things at the local level. So then you're going to land on this conclusion, which is the link between public health and civic participation. So this is a summary box of everything that we've discussed. So I hope that you will take the time to read this and you know read, share, and go through some of the resources that we've linked and learn more. And then share that information with your friends, with your colleagues, with your family members, um, and get the word out. Um, we're hoping to help really put one more tool in the arsenal for supporting why um, access to the ballot is so important for us as individuals and as communities. And so as I mentioned, you have, you will then be able at the bottom of the site, be able to click on methods, limitations, and references. And so on this page, you're going to see a few things. You're going to see the explanation of the cost of voting index that I went through. You're going to see definitions for all the health metrics and why they matter. You're going to see data sources. So I mentioned the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. We um, we also use census data. We use America's Health Rankings. We use some data from the CDC, and so all those are listed and with whichever metric they're associated with and the year. Um, I believe all of them are 2020, with um, with a few exceptions. So infant mortality, for example, is 2018. Um, it has a, a limitation section. And that's important because we recognize that this is not um, everything that we could possibly say. And there are some things that we just don't know. So one is this is all about how these uh, metrics are correlated with voting, right? But they're not talking about causal relationships. And so one thing that we say is that more research is needed. So if you're on this call and you're a researcher, here's an area, area where we need to know more. So we know that um, things like social cohesion um, and neighborhood safety are really important to people being able to turn out, being able to turn out and get engaged. But we need more research about exactly how the things like that are linked, um, cause that link between voting and health to exist. Um, we also, as I mentioned, do not have race and ethnicity data included here yet. And that's partly complicated by the way that data are collected and reported. Daniel shared the health equity tracker. And if you go through the health equity tracker, it's also going to tell you about this particular limitation. All states do not collect race and ethnicity data the same way. All states don't collect SOGI data or sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, the categories are not the same across states, and some states um, don't even acknowledge that certain races exist and, and they report out. Um, I live in Florida. We often get reports that are Black, White, Other, Hispanic, Non-Hispanic. And 
if you're not black or white or Hispanic or non-Hispanic, you go into the other category. Um, and that does not compare to other states. Like I grew up in New Mexico, I'm from New Mexico, um, and we have, I don't even know how many categories. So um, so that makes it a little bit more challenging to, to um, do an analysis there, but we are working on that. Um, and the last thing, as I mentioned, you're gonna see references and you're gonna see resources. So again, we hope that you will go through those resources and references and, and take that time to learn more. So I mentioned my second favorite part of the website, which is the voting policy picker, but this is my favorite part. This is the interactive data, ta data table. So you can click through to this and you're gonna see this data table and it's basically like a heat map. You can sort by each metric and you can sort highest to lowest or lowest to highest for every single one of these. It's really cool. Um, if you hover over each of these, so again, we wanted to make sure you know what you're looking at while you're on that page. If you hover over any of these health metrics, you're going to see the definition of that particular metric. So this one that's highlighted is self-rated health. And then you also are going to be able to hyperlink to the state landing page. So if you're looking at this and you want to go look at Alabama, you click on Alabama and you'll go to that state page that we were looking at. So um, hopefully you can see the transitioning. I wanna just say I was very excited that I figured out how to make my own gift this morning. And so this is it. So you're seeing this with me going through and clicking through um, and showing you how the different ways you can sort it from, from highest to lowest and lowest to highest across three, across three different options, the cost of voting, overall health and self-rated health. Um, and so you will get to go do exactly this and see how the table changes and see um, you know, how states are performing at, and, and this higher level on this interactive data table page. So I want to make sure that I um, acknowledge uh, the About the Index page. So this is also one of the pages that you can land on. And it's important to note that none of this is possible alone. So on the About page, the About page, you can see all of our contributors, our stakeholders, our design team. Um, you can see them all listed here. And I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has made this possible. I know that some of you are on this call today. I want to say, honestly, it's a dream. Um, I love data. I was a microbiologist in a former life. And, um, and so I, I appreciated that I've had the opportunity to get to, honestly, get to work in an environment where I get to um, look at data and look at the law and draw connections between those things for people. And I think that it's really you know, I'm grateful also to the Network for Public Health Law that, um, that that's something that I get to do um, every day. And so the last thing I'm gonna talk about is next steps. And what's next? So more research, more data and calls to action. So um, a reminder here that what you see is directly connected to available research. So we need more. Um, we wanna look at other population characteristics. We have um, been asked if we're going to include county level data. We've also heard some suggestions about ways to incorporate the social vulnerability index or area deprivation index um, and other social determinants of health like housing and education. Um, and then importantly, uh, ways to take action and use data for advocacy, especially if you work in public health, that's one of our core functions is how do we use data to improve health outcomes? And we hope that you can use the data that you find here um, to have conversations about the health of your state, have, about the health of your communities, and, and ways that you can make changes to improve health outcomes. So, um, so with that, I just wanted to say thank you um, to everyone, and really looking forward to questions uh, and conversation. Don, again, thank you very, very much. Um, and to get us for our calls for action, uh, Leah Bathia. Leah. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Don. That framework is so incredible. It is going to change the way that we fundamentally do this work, and we're so, so excited for it. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Alia Bhatia. I'm the Acting Executive Director at Vote ER and Civic Health Month, and today is August 31st, the final day of Civic Health Month, an annual month-long recognition of the light, vital link between voting and health. To close our discussion, I wanna share a story that helps explain the importance of this sustained national attention on voting and health. A few years ago, I went on a ride along with the emergency medical services at a major hospital network. Scott was the manager who took me around the community, showed me how various of his EMTs and ambulances were serving families and communities. So much of what was happening in front of us was clearly coming from local, state, and national policies. And given my experiences in education and housing, 
I was fairly aware of the social determinants of health. But then I asked Scott, Scott, you can just change one thing. You have a magic wand, it only can change one thing. What's your one thing you would change? And his answer surprised me. He said, Aaliyah, I wish all my patients would vote. Because if all my patients vote, that would ensure that politicians invested more resources in my EMS. It would mean that resources went into housing, jobs, and education. And these are the services that many of my patients actually need. A few months after this conversation with Scott, I joined VoteR. As the pandemic accelerated, we provided voter registration kits to tens of thousands of doctors, nurses, physician assistants, and social workers on the front lines of patient care. That work was made possible by dozens of volunteers who assembled and shipped these kits last summer. One of these volunteers was named Christina. And since she did not work in health, I asked her, Christina, why are you volunteering with us? Christina said, my husband is immunocompromised. I cannot go to the protests. I cannot vote in person. The primary is a week away and my ballot has not arrived in the mail. I have a black son and I have to do something. I want to make sure that everyone who wants to vote can vote safely and that they don't have to make the trade-off that I am having to make between my husband's health and my voice and my democracy. I do this work for Christina, for her husband, for her son. I do this work for Scott and his patients, and I suspect everyone on this call does it for those folks as well. Over the past year, the dynamic connection between health and voting has become even more palpable. With 240 organizations in Civic Health Month, the celebration has more than doubled from our inaugural year last year to where we stand right now on this call. And today, to cap off Civic Health Month, we are sitting here with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, with the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse, with a Healthy Democracy, Healthy People Initiative, and with the American Public Health Association. And we have in our fingertips, concrete and thorough frameworks and tools, like the political determinants of health and the health and democracy index that you just saw Don present. With incredible wins like this at our backs, we have the opportunity to bring this concept of civic health into our daily lives with concrete actions that encode it into how we carry out the daily practice of healthcare. With these tools, we are positioned to join others in our organizations and our communities to play a role in ensuring access to the ballot for all. So here are a few things that you can do. If you are a healthcare provider, order one of the voter registration kits that volunteers like Christina helped to create. They're called Healthy Democracy Kits, and you can get one at voteer.org slash kit. If you're an administrator or a leader in a hospital or health organization, present the Health and Democracy Index that you saw Don present at one of your upcoming grand rounds and decide how your organization can ensure that marginalized voices are front and center in dictating the policies that govern their health. If you are a hospital, you can start to seamlessly weave in voting to your services using our tools at voteer.org. If you're a member of a professional association, introduce and adopt a resolution that helps your community of healthcare providers commit to the link between voting and health. And if you're interested in how federal policy can help enable a more diverse and inclusive democracy through health, join us for our next discussion on September 15th where we will look at how Medicaid programs and other health policy decisions can help some of the hardest to reach voters to be involved in our democratic process through systems like automatic voter registration. And everyone, please do what Christina and Scott asked us to do. Whether the upcoming election in your neighborhood is for a dog catcher or for president, vote like our health depends on it because we know that it does. Right now, we'd like everyone on this call to commit to a next step. On your screen in just a moment, you will see a Zoom poll pop up. We'd like you to select which action that you were gonna to take to help advance this work around health and democracy. And then in just a few moments, we'll head back to Dr. Benjamin to facilitate a question and answer segment.
Hope you're taking this moment to fill out the poll. Few more seconds. Note that the links that you need in order to do any of these are in the chat. You can click on them now to get started on any of these. These are wonderful results. There's so much that folks are setting out to do. And uh, Jean is gonna get 25 emails from those of you who said you're gonna start introducing resolutions in your professional organization. So we're so excited for that. Um, I'm handing it over to uh, Dr. Benjamin to take us forward with the Q&A. Well, this is great, this is great. So if I could have um, Daniel and, and Jean and Don um, um, and Leah all, if you put your cameras back on. Thank you. And um, so uh, we, we, had, we had some questions and I know there was some early on about health equity. Um, and um, I, I guess the way to maybe do this, I, I don't actually have names for some of these individuals. So if, um, Daniel, if you would talk a little bit about, um, again, reemphasizing this whole issue of equity as a, um, um, uh, a political determinant and a little bit more about how voting makes that difference. I think you're still here. Oh, Daniel needed to leave. So maybe, maybe if I could have um, um, Gene, if you can answer that for us. And you mute it. One of the, one of the things that's really important as we work to um, expand understanding is to, in an organized narrative, is to identify the patterns. And so this is sort of a first, a first um, shot at identifying the pattern that we can see across the country using a number of metrics, health metrics that were um, uh, uh, already, already vetted and, and considered. Um, Don, I think, spoke more clearly about the constraints that we found when we began to try to do that analysis um, using um, race, ethnicity, uh, language, gender identification. And um, that is actually an, an important and necessary uh, part of telling the story and doing the analysis. Um, and it comes back to the limitations, which Daniel did mention of our, of our um, our uh, data around around metrics. If you don't count it, then it isn't that it isn't a problem. And so it was dis disappointing to us that even voting metrics didn't get included in the in the Healthy People 2030. And these kinds of metrics help us look at the patterns and tell the story. And I think that Don can. Um, add a little in terms of the more specifics, but we'd love to do more research in this area or more analysis. And um, that would be the next phase and is a high level, high on our commitment, as well as I know there were some questions about geographic analysis. And so I think those are both both important. Don, did you, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll let's add really quickly that you know, we do have very clear data about who votes and who doesn't and who experiences barriers to vote and who doesn't, right? And so um, people, younger people experience barriers to voting, people with disabilities, um, low income people, and people of color across the US experience um, much higher barriers to voting than other populations. And so that, and that looks like it, different forms. So that might be um, whether or not you can get the approved form of ID in your state, that might be um, restrictions around how to return absentee ballots. 
Um, that might be accessibility of polling locations. So if you're a person with disability, um, or if you're a person that speaks an alternative language, um, you know, is your polling location doing a good job of making sure that that materials are available in other languages for you? So how accessible is voting to you? Um, and so the, we have a lot of data on that on those things. And there's some great organizations that put out reports on that after uh, major election cycles. Um, and I think I would also just say that I know that a question came in about whether or not the data that we've included is by party affiliation. And the answer to that is no. Um, voting um, is nonpartisan and access to the ballot is nonpartisan. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not research on this. So if you are interested, there is a lot of research on party affiliation, health and voting, um, especially over the last probably um, decade or so. So there, that information is out there that is not a part of our analysis. One, one, thank you. One of the one of the things that uh, was asked is about the voting kind of as a harm reduction strategy is kind of a way to think about voting. Um, can you expound upon that? Donna Jean? Is that question in the um, Q&A box? It was in the chat box. Uh, one of it was in the one of the Q&A boxes. Oh, I, I think Jean, I think Lisa Campbell asked it. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, um, I, I don't have the question in front of me, but one of the things that we know is that civic participation, social cohesion, inclusion, engagement, all help with individual and community health. And I think about that in terms of harm reduction. And those, when you read through and you see the sort of narrative framing that we've used, we've really tried to lead with our health is improved when there's social inclusion. And, and, um, and it should be our aim to assure that everyone has the opportunity to, to, to be included and to help influence the decisions. And so when I think about harm reduction on that level, that's how I think about it. Um, and then I'm not quite sure if they were thinking more specifically about some of the other harm reduction strategies um, so uh, uh, that are, you know, targeting individual health issues. Yeah. Well, I, obviously, you know, um, voting for people who support the issues that you care about helps get those issues that you care about addressed, if, assuming that they, they win the positions that you want. So uh, obviously one needs to align those two. I, I want to just, um, I saw some intriguing uh, data present at a vote ER event in April that actually took the language around our zip codes more impactful than our, than our um, genetic code and began to unpack that in terms of who voted. And I think that makes the point, Dr. Benjamin, that you, that you just made, that if you aren't showing up in a space politically um, represented uh, at the at the policy making table, that's how. I mean, it's just not a lot of people decided to move to a zip code and not, you know, take care of themselves or something like, which is in that individual health narrative. It's actually whether or not the concerns they have are prioritized, and that's another way of thinking about harm reduction. I guess the only thing I would add to that is like thinking about levels of prevention. You know, we start with being able to vote in the per first place. And then sometimes people get elected, right, who don't represent our interests. And so then, you know, another level of prevention is making sure you get out and you contact those people who are elected to communicate what your needs are, right? So we, it doesn't just stop after we vote and people go, get into office. We have to main, maintain those lines of communication. And then probably another level of, of intervention is really once policies get enacted, how do we monitor their impact and how do we mitigate their impact if, if they're harmful? And so I think about that, maybe applying a harm reduction framework is looking at the different levels that you can intervene at when it comes to voting and policy making in your community. I'd love to jump in for a second here. Uh, Lisa's question is so important in part because it speaks to specifically local elections. Uh, when we turn to the quarter into this year, um, we weren't sure how many people were going to ask the question, you know, what is VODR doing now? There's no election where what they really meant was there was not a presidential election. Last week, I was on a call with a professor at Brown University 
uh, Dr. Jonathan Collins, and his work is all around sort of the, the impact of voting on local elections. And he told me two really important things. He said, remember, Aaliyah, most local elections, people do not identify based on their party. And so the thing that's going to influence what sort of policy positions they craft and sell to the public are going to be who is actually going to show up and vote for them, recognizing that the party platform won't differentiate that many, at least, you know, I'm in the metro Atlanta area, most people run on nonpartisan platforms for these local elections. And then the second thing you said that I thought just just really blew my mind. He talked about the preference distribution as different from the partisan distribution. He said, Aaliyah, if you look at homeowners who are liberal and renters who are liberal, they have different positions about what should happen around housing and zoning policy. And if we truly want a representative democracy, then those renters need to be voting in their local election so that their preferences are accounted for by those local politicians who don't have to stake out a claim to be part of a party that identifies their values. Um, so just given that the question is very specifically about local elections, and fortunately all you know, 200 plus of you on this call are still seeing the incredible relevance of that um, in uh, the year 2021, uh, just wanna call out some of the very specific reasons that local elections matter. Well, here's a question I think that aligns with that. Is that. I'm wondering if our voter access engagement rates are whitewashed in certain states. Um, appreciate the breakdown and focus on disparities in health outcomes, but this, this um, person worries that our civic engagement score is skewed in states that might have huge disparities in voter, voter turnout. So, so I think- Score versus voter turnout. That's a, a good question. Um, we didn't we didn't look at um, those underlying demographics of turnout, but I will say that the cost of voting index actually is a pretty extensive analysis that controls for several different factors that impact voter turnout. And so that's part of what the index takes into account. So we don't include those metrics in the index. So we we link to the 2020 version, but the 2016 um, article that the first time that the COVID, COVID index, I always wanna say COVID, COVID index was published um, actually includes a very good explanation of the different um, factors that are controlled for in doing the analysis. Um, things that are known to impact voter turnout, like um, you just heard Leah saying, uh, home ownership, especially in local elections. Um, so those are all things that are controlled for in, in determining the cost of voting ranking. Okay. No, the, the other um, question, health is a complex system and yet most not all public health schools do not teach systems thinking um, or complexity science. If taught, students would know about tools such as causal feedback loops, um, you know, iceberg modeling, um, all these things enable student, students to do systems thinking. Uh, how can public health schools be encouraged to integrate more systems thinking in their, um, in their curriculum? Any thoughts about that? Well, I find, um this one of the things that has helped me uh, most as a public health official has been um, translating the patterns that we see and the skills that you can develop through systems thinking into action. And it is something that I think needs to get layered on to a set of approaches that have been codified for many, many years that are actually flowing from um, an individual medical model, an individual person medical model. And I just think that's a, that's a big conversation that should be happening, not just in schools of public health, but in our public health agencies and organizations. And, and it doesn't mean you have to throw everything out. You can actually layer in systems approaches into the work that is funded and that you, that we're doing. And uh, it's a, it's a particular area of passion of mine. So Thank you for whoever asked that. That's great. Can I add to that? Yes, please. I would just say, you know, when I did my master's work, I had to do field placement um, and I did mine with the AIDS Institute here in Tampa and they also have an office in DC. And I thought that was really eye-opening and it was funny because I was, I was uh, a microbiologist and I was working in research and I wanted to do something in a lab. And my advisor said, 
but you, you know, you, you want to go to law school and you want to do this. And why don't you try doing something that's more policy oriented? And so that's how I ended up with the AIDS Institute. And um, it was really eye opening because it gave me some perspective on the application of public health to like real world outcomes. And I think that um, we probably should, schools should really reevaluate, you know, what required field placements are, consider a component where you actually have to have exposure to a health department, your local health department or your state health department. And also tying in what you learn to real world examples and case studies, which I don't think we got enough of. I was just talking on a panel yesterday about some of the greatest public health achievements in our lifetime. And one of those, of course, is um, tobacco use reduction. And part of that's because of the master settlement agreement. Well, I didn't know just how critical the master settlement agreement is to funding public health services in the states until I started working in a health department. Um, and that's just something I didn't learn in school, but it's a really big, from a systems perspective, understanding um, the legal challenges that went into making that happen, how it was deployed in the states, even the variations in, in how states use those dollars, um, and, and having conversations about what that looks like. So I think just you know, tying more of our curriculum into like real world examples and experiences. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the one of the one of the one of the um, folks asked, "Are there plans to include sub county data?" So we are looking at more granular data, ways to include more granular data. But part of that is the cost of voting index um, that we have right now is at the state level. And so, in addition to having to get um, county and sub county data, we also need to would be need to be able to adapt the COVID index to county and sub county data, and that's going to take some time. Okay. Um, here's a question about um, um, you know, it says, I understand and agree that personal efforts to overcome barriers to registration and to casting a ballot representative um, has substantial cost of voting. Another sizable underlying cost, she thinks, is overcoming passive passive apathy and hopelessness and being passive, the feeling that uh, one's vote may not matter. Um, what, what's the answer to that? Because, you know, people don't engage in the process and they don't think that their vote matters. I'm happy to jump in on this. I had the honor of taking a graduate school class with uh, Dana Chisnell, who used to run the Center for Civic Design. And um, in that course, she shows us something called the epic journey of the American voter. And what she basically shows is that it's not that there is apathy over here and difficulty to vote over here. They're actually heavily inter interlinked. And that when you can't see how the end you know, outcome of you casting a ballot is gonna make it you know, any simpler to get past all these other roadblocks that it takes to actually cast that ballot, becomes really hard to participate in that process in a way that reflects in the way that we see it as apathy, but is not actually apathy. It is actually a, a bunch of systems factors that make it hard for you to assess how important that vote is and how to actually cast that vote. Um, and I, I share that because uh, we've gotten to a place where not just the sort of folks at, at expert levels are talking about voter apathy, but where individuals themselves have decided to name that thing apathy themselves. And that creates an even bigger hurdle for us. Um, one thing we're working on at VoteR is what does it look like for a doctor, a nurse, a social worker to have this conversation with a patient to make that, that leap really quickly? Because if a, a patient says, oh, I don't want to register to vote because, you know, why should I vote? We need to figure out how those conversations can be had swiftly and thoughtfully um, to kind of close that gap around why the person thinks about themselves in that way. And I'll add two really important examples. One is integrated voter engagement. And so this is really an example of how you get community members involved in engage, and engaged in the voting process all year round. So it's ways of having communities involved in identifying prior, priorities and organizing around them and advocating for those issues um, around elections and, and throughout the year. And another really um, good recent example is Nonprofit Vote. Nonprofit Vote just put out a report called Nonprofit Power that talked about nonprofit outreach to, um, to populations that are considered undervoters. 
Um, and it's a great report and just the success rate they had in getting people to turn out over similar voters in the population um, who did not have that kind of outreach is just really astounding. So it just speaks to the importance of these types of efforts to get out and have a personal connection with voters who are hesitant or apathetic or concerned about um, whether or not their vote is going to count. Yeah, that, that's an important question. I know there's another question here, which I'm going to adjust a little bit because I think you answered the question about research uh, on the level of apathy among voters. Although if, if one of you knows where one could Google that and actually find that research, that would be helpful. Um, but the other thing is for people who don't think that their lives got better under President Obama, um, they did, they got substantially better. Um, you know, and the question is how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you let people know that their lives have gotten better when they don't see that their lives have gotten better? I guess that's the question. Because that, that matters, that, that adjusts the voting issue substantially. Well, I'm a data person, so I'm always saying, let's look at the data. One of the things I like to talk about is infant mortality. And um, if Daniel was on here, he might talk about this because we know infant mortality was significantly re reduced because of Medicaid expansion. And we see continued disparities in states that have not expanded Medicaid, um, which is a policy decision. And we see continued disparities in the adults who aren't covered. Last I looked, 60% of the adults who are eligible in states that haven't expanded are people of color. So for me, it's important, and that why the Health and Democracy Index is important, is to have the data behind the narrative so that we can explain to people why this matters, like who's really being impacted and how are they being impacted. So that would be my, my response to that. And I just also want to add that um, I don't, we, we do confuse voting with voting for particular people. And, uh, and then we hold, then we act like we just put all our eggs in a basket and everything should happen. And I think that what we need to be doing and part of what we're doing with this index and, and when you use a systems approach and you look at what Daniel is, has done is you look historically at what's the pattern and what are the things that have made things better and what are the actions that have been taken that make things worse. And of course the better and worse might be different depending on whose chair you're sitting in, you know, the interpretation, but to be questioning those assumptions so the women getting the right to vote um, and the, the uh, voting rights um, uh, acts in, in, um, in the 60s both improved infant mortality. So the historical context is important. Um, and then as things get chipped away, chipped away, chipped away, you start to see um, the pattern uh, either not improving or getting worse. And I think that's part of why we need to teach systems theory. We need to be thinking about the patterns. We need to be able to tell the story within that broader context. Listen, I want to thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I wish we had all day to have this conversation, but it's, it's 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, a little earlier for those of you who are on the West Coast. Um, I, I just want to please give our, 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 our panel, a, I'll just say a great round of applause. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do so for all of us. So Jean, um, Don, uh, Aaliyah, and folks, if those of you, I know um, Daniel's staff are still on the call, please give him our thank you. And I, I just want to thank you for all the work you're doing, ladies. Um, you know, voting is basically the, the ball game. It's, it's the most important public health intervention I think that any of us can do. Um, so with that, I want to thank you. Uh, and on behalf of the uh, American Public Health Association, uh, and our um, collaborating groups. I want to thank you all for this uh, amazing um, webinar today. So thank you.